Chapter 32 Here Lies the Mighty Argenvast The sun shone on a quiet promontory, not far from where Henry and his companions were hidden among the trees. Perched on the craggy bluff, in partial ruins, was the castle of Argenvastholt. Travelling here from the winery had taken the better part of the day. Along the road they had passed a family of Barovians, who were rejoicing because they thought the devil was dead. Henry and Casimir had tried to convince them that Count Strahd was still alive and dangerous. But the happy family had simply pointed to the sun and told them the curse was clearly ended. The mist was gone, so they said, and they were on their way to the world beyond. Nothing Henry or Casimir had said could dissuade them. What do you mean you can't find it? Henry asked Rowan when she returned. The sun was low in the sky, and Rowan had just come back from scouting out the castle. I mean, I've searched every floor of that place, and I don't even know what I'm looking for, Rowan said. Maybe the man in armor knows something about this holy symbol of hope. Who? Henry and Casimir asked at the same time. The castle is virtually empty, except for the nest of giant spiders, some abandoned furniture, and a creepy man in armor. There were also a few rooms I couldn't enter because they were locked. It's possible that what we need is behind the locked doors, Casimir said. Wait, Henry held up his hand. What do you mean by a creepy man in armor? I saw a lone man with a grey face, sitting on a chair, holding a sword, and staring vacantly out a window. Yeah, that's creepy, Henry said. But you know what? We should totally talk to him. Irina moaned. Uh, I'd rather not. He might know what we are looking for, Casimir said. Mark my words, Irina retorted. Meeting strange men never goes well for me. Either they want to bite me, marry me, kidnap me, steal my face. I'm sorry, Irina, Rowan said. But I also think the man in the castle might have the answers we need. We should try talking with him. Dusk is coming soon, and I don't want to be in that place after dark. All right, Irina sighed and followed Rowan. All four of them walked around to the other side of the castle, passing a cemetery that looked pillaged by grave robbers. An octagonal mausoleum was erected in the back of the yard, with four dragon-like gargoyles perched on its tile roof. Henry suddenly felt like they were being watched. He looked up at the castle and saw the silhouette of a man in a window. As soon as he turned his face to the others and looked back, however, the man had disappeared. I don't like this, Casimir said, following behind Henry. Look at this place. Someone's been digging up graves. Henry was about to comment when Rowan opened a postern door to the castle and slipped inside. They all followed her into a small chapel. An altar stood at the front of the nave, and kneeling before it were two men clad in chainmail. Their heads turned and looked at the intruders with eyes like glowing pits of white fire. The outlines of their skulls showed through the skin of their gaunt faces. One of the men was... Ismark? Irina called out. But Ismark and the other man only raised their weapons to attack. The unfamiliar man rushed at Henry, who caught the blow with his shield and drew Apollo. We're back in action, Apollo's voice rang in Henry's mind. Who are these uglies? Henry presented his sword and shield in a defensive stance and cast his divine sense. Immediately he felt the presence of undeath. But these did not look like vampires. Who are you? Henry demanded of his attacker. The undead man continued to beset him, but Henry deftly turned aside each strike. You must leave here at once, the man shouted. Sorry, Henry said. That's not going to happen until we get some answers. He shifted to the offensive, 
and Apollo cut through the other man's shield like butter. But he soon discovered that his opponent was no amateur with a sword. Even without a shield, the undead swordsman proved more than capable of trading blows, cut and thrust, back and forth. Fighting beside Henry, Rowan parried an attack from Ismark's sword with her spear. Ismark! Irina cried, standing near the door. What are you doing? I do not know that name, said Ismark. I am Sir Maudlin, knight of the Order of the Silver Dragon. You are trespassing here. Leave now or die. Stand back, Casimir said, taking a stance beside Rowan and brandishing his wand. If you are a knight of Argenvost, we need your help. Casimir's words were ignored, as the man who called himself Sir Mordelin swung his sword again at Rowan. They must be some kind of ghouls, Henry said, after ducking under another slash. You mean revenants, Casimir corrected him. If you're not Ismark and you're bent on killing us, then so be it. Rowan cast a bolt of fire from her spear. The knight, Sir Mordelin, was surprisingly agile and shifted to one side as the flame hurled past him. By now Herkimoid was flying around the chapel, jabbing the undead men with his stinger. But the pseudo-dragon's poisoned tail seemed to have no effect on them. Casimir and Irina threw themselves into the fight. Windows were blasted and old pews were smashed to splinters. Clearly these two knights were expert warriors and overpowering them was not easy. Yet in the end, the weight of numbers began to tell, and the four friends cut them down. Why? Irina asked, kneeling beside the bodies. Henry wiped the sweat from his brow. What the hell, Rowan? You didn't say anyone else was in here. I didn't see them, Rowan spat. Herkimoid landed on her shoulder. I told you there were places I couldn't go. That's probably where they came from. But why? Irina asked again. If they were revenants, Casimir said, and I'm pretty sure they were, then they'll be back in a day or two. But don't worry, he added when he saw Irina's face. I don't think they can inhabit the same body more than once. Revenants, Henry said. Aren't they like ghosts? They are vengeful spirits of the departed that possess the dead bodies of others. Irina touched the face of her brother. Whatever they were, they had no right to take Ismark's body. We'll bury him again, Rowan said, once we find what we need. The druid led the others through a mess hall to an ostentatious foyer with peeling frescoes and statues of dragons. Herkimoid, who had been flitting from Henry to Rowan to Irina, flew around the statues, mimicking their noble poses. They walked quietly up a grand staircase that reached down like arms from either side of the foyer. Rowan led them past the second floor, directly to the third. Here they found a yawning hole in the ceiling, and walls that looked like they had been shattered by siege engines or by magic. To their right, the corridor was open to a large audience chamber through a gap in the wall. They climbed together over the rubble. Broken masonry and rusted weapons littered the floor, and at the other end of the chamber sat a slumped figure in a throne carved like dragon's wings. The throne faced away from them toward three enormous windows overlooking the western hills. You defeated my knights in the chapel, the slumped figure spoke. Have you come to destroy me? You may try, but my spirit will only find a new corpse if you kill this one. So, Henry thought, he is a revenant. We aren't here to kill you, Henry said. He was close enough to see the figure's hand tighten around the hilt of a greatsword. The sword's tip was resting on the floor, and its hilt, a bronze-cast dragon's head, was pointing up at the cracked ceiling. We're looking for something. We're hoping you can help. 
Are you here because of Strahd von Zarevich? The man's voice had the roughness and cadence of a grinding millstone. Henry exchanged a look of uncertainty with the others. Rahadin had said that the knights of Argenvost fought against Strahd during the invasion. If these really were the spirits of those dead knights, then they should want to help. We are his enemies, Henry said. As am I. The figure stood up and turned to address them face to face. His pallid cheeks were sunken, and his eyes, like the other undead knights, glowed white in their wide sockets. A few tufts of hair protruded from the top and sides of his grey scalp. There is no one I loathe more than Strahd von Zarevich. He destroyed everything I lived for. My noble lord, my devoted knights, and my lover who fought by my side. Then we want the same thing, Henry said. Unfortunately, your companions downstairs didn't want to listen, but we can work together. We're here to find a treasure that can help defeat Strahd and end the curse once and for all. What is your name, good knight? The revenant's stern face did not change. Why do you call me good? I am Sir Vladimir Horngard, and I am nothing more than vengeance. I will never rest, and I will not allow Strahd's misery to end. Henry took a step forward. We want justice, same as you. Strahd will answer for his crimes. He'll get what's his when he's dead and damned to the Nine Hells. You're wrong, the Revenant pointed his sword at Henry. Strahd is already in hell, one of his own making. It's my task to see that he never leaves. You should not have come here, but I'm glad you did. Now I can stop you. What the fuck? Irina said. You might be dead, but other people still live in this valley. You let all of them suffer just to satisfy your sick appetite for revenge? You, Vladimir said, pointing his sword now at Irina. You're her, aren't you? Yes, I've had the pleasure of seeing Strahd weep over the death of his precious Tatiana several times before. I look forward to seeing it again. What agony it will be for him when he comes here and finds her mutilated corpse, once again slain by my hand. Irina shook her head in horror. I knew it! I just knew it! We'll never let you touch her! Rowan leveled her spear and stepped in front of Irina. What will you do? Vladimir walked toward them. Kill me? I'll return and hunt you down. You will never gain what you seek. You do know what we need, then, Henry said, his hand on Apollo's hilt. The treasure! Where is it? Vladimir pulled a medallion from beneath his armor. It was hanging from a cord around his neck, a silver sunburst the size of a man's palm, and it held a ruby at its center. Treasure, relic, talisman, call it what you like. Its power against vampires is legendary. If you really hate Strahd, Henry said, let us use it, or use it yourself and help us. I promise you, the Count will pay. Yes, he will pay. I will see to it that he does. Then Vladimir charged at Irina. Before he could reach his intended victim, Rowan stopped him with her spear. She struck the revenant, but did not pierce his armor. Undeterred, Vladimir shoved the druid aside and again lunged at Irina. This time his blade clashed with the steel of Irina's sword. Now Henry joined the action, and Apollo lit the chamber like noonday. He rushed to Irina's defense, giving Vladimir such a torrent of blows that the undead knight was driven back before his fury. When he heard Casimir cast a spell, Henry felt a surge of energy, and everything around him seemed to slow. Casimir's magic now coursing through him allowed Henry to move with superhuman speed. 
the four companions set upon their enemy in a storm of steel and magic. They pressed him hard, but their every blow was either parried by his long blade or blocked by his stout armor. Centuries of fighting experience had made Vladimir a more than formidable opponent, and he handled his sword with skill that Henry had never seen before. Not only was he able to hold the four of them at bay, he also made counterattacks toward Irina at every opportunity. Henry's breath would catch in his throat each time Vladimir's sword came close to Irina. But she had taken Henry's lessons to heart and defended herself like a well-trained soldier. A spell from Casimir's wand went wild, shattering one of the large windows. Glass flew everywhere. "'There are more coming!' Rowan cried. Henry heard armored boots tramping up the stairs. "'We need to get that symbol!' he shouted, and redoubled his attack. But each lunge was met by blade on blade. Just as Rowan was about to cast another spell, ten more revenants charged into the room. "'Shit!' Henry said. Vladimir pointed at Irina. "'It's Tatiana! Kill her!' "'Irina, we need to get you out of here! Come!' Rowan said, and she dashed for the broken window. Irina followed, barely dodging the swing of a poleaxe. "'Get ready and hop on my back!' By the time they reached the ledge, the druid was already a giant eagle. After mounting up, Irina looked back. "'Henry, come on!' "'Right behind you,' Henry said, unfurling his wings. Rowan snatched Casimir in her talons and flew out into the open air with Herkimoid soaring above them. Just as Henry reached the window, he stopped and turned around. There was the talisman dangling from Vladimir's neck. "'We need it,' thought Henry, "'for the prophecy!' The revenants were charging now, but Henry did not move until they were almost upon him. Parrying a sword stroke, he grabbed Vladimir by the lip of his breastplate and pulled him through the window. Together they tumbled from the ledge. For a moment, they wrestled in the air, and Henry tried to flap his wings, but the fall was too quick, and they hit the ground with a crunch. They crashed right in front of the castle gate. Henry was dazed. He had landed mostly on his left arm, but he must have hit his head too. Vladimir pushed Henry aside and got to his feet. Then he lifted his sword and thrust it at the fallen paladin. As the blade came down, Henry rolled, and the sword stabbed the ground, flinging up bits of gravel. Henry scrambled to his feet and raised Apollo, but he found he could not lift his shield arm. It hung uselessly at his side, and a shooting pain in his shoulder told him it was broken. "'You're hurt, man. We need to get the hell out of here!' Apollo said in Henry's mind. Henry heard the sound of the castle's front gate opening and the sound of the other revenants marching toward them. We're staying, he replied. Then he closed with his opponent. Their blades clashed, their feet shuffled forward and back, each swordsman trying to gain the upper hand. Henry yelled and gritted his teeth as Vladimir landed a blow on the pauldron of his broken shoulder. Skirting to avoid another stroke, Henry was pushed back toward the large dragon statue that stood in the middle of the road. Just then, with the gates fully open, a company of undead knights issued forth. They deployed from column into line, but they did not move to interfere with the duel playing out before them. Vladimir! one of the knights called out. He was standing in the vanguard, holding back the other revenants. Stop this madness! Stay out of it, Godfrey, Vladimir said. I'm going to kill him. Beset by another brutal assault, Henry was forced to give ground. Now that Casimir's magic had worn off, Vladimir was faster and stronger. They both knew it. Henry's lack of a shield made him vulnerable, and exhaustion was beginning to take its toll. If only he could just grab that talisman. He slipped and dodged, parrying over and over, until finally, the tip of Vladimir's blade clipped his throat. The revenant sneered when he saw the red fountain spurting from Henry's neck. Henry stumbled back, clasping the wound with his sword hand, bathing Apollo's hilt with his own blood. He knew the artery was cut. 
and he had mere seconds to heal himself before he would die. The undead knight lowered his sword. It's over, boy. But it was not over. Vladimir must not have seen the glow of Henry's fingers, or understood that he had staunched the bleeding. This was his chance, maybe his only chance. When Vladimir came closer, his guard still down, Henry lunged forward with a carefully aimed thrust. Apollo found the gap between the fold and placard of Vladimir's armor, piercing him through the gut. Vladimir did not even flinch. Instead, he merely grabbed Henry's wrist and pulled the gleaming blade deeper into his belly. Then Henry felt a jab like a hammer blow to the chest. Vladimir had drawn a rondel dagger with his left hand and slammed it into the chainmail under Henry's arm, where it was now buried to the hilt. The revenant grabbed Henry's shoulder to embrace him in a clinch. I've been at this game much longer than you have, boy. Vladimir's breath was cold on Henry's ear. And I'll be at it long after you're gone. Henry struggled to breathe. More than just pain, there was a strange drowning sensation in his lungs. He coughed, and the cough splattered blood on Vladimir's face. Casimir felt Rowan's grip slipping, and she swooped down just in time to drop him on a mound of grass. Look! Irina pointed back at the castle. Henry was still at the gate, locked in a mortal struggle with Vladimir, a host of revenants looking on. Irina jumped from Rowan's back and started running toward Henry, but Rowan grabbed her with her beak. I'll go, Casimir said. He ran with his wand drawn, but he could not get a clear shot to cast a spell. The two swordsmen were a frenzy of whirling blades. Casimir kept running. He was less than a hundred feet away when it happened. Henry skewered the revenant on his sword, and Vladimir plunged a dagger in Henry's side. Now they were pressed together, chest to chest, each man trying to destroy the other. Henry looked at Casimir from afar and cried, Bolt him! Use lightning! It would kill you both, Casimir shouted. Fucking do it and take the talisman. I'm already dead. Blood was pouring from Henry's mouth with every word. Casimir took a deep breath, steadied his wand, and cast a spell. A titanic lightning bolt streaked across the sky. Vladimir dropped, and so did Henry. Then all the world seemed to go quiet except for Casimir's feet crunching on gravel as he ran to his fallen friend. He pointed his wand at the crowd of revenants by the gate. Stay back, he warned, then waved his other hand in an arcane pattern over Henry's unconscious body. He spoke an incantation and felt his own vitality seeping away. Casimir absorbed Henry's injuries until he could bear it no more. He released the spell and fell back. Irina and Rowan arrived. The druid took a stand between the revenants and her friends, holding her spear out defensively. Don't come any closer, she said. None of them moved. Irina dropped to Henry's side and began stripping off his armor to get at his wound. But he had already stopped bleeding, and his skin was as pale as the revenants. Casimir, do something, Irina yelled, tears streaming down her face. Casimir, slumped on the ground, knew there was nothing more he could do. Henry, you stupid ass, wake up! Irina shook him. Get up! Get up! Casimir, Rowan said, without taking her eyes from the crowd of knights. Can you get the talisman? Casimir, weakened to the point of death himself, crawled over to Vladimir's body and searched for the sunburst medallion but it was nowhere to be found. It's gone, he said. He can't die, Irina murmured through a shroud of tears. Morning, Lord, please, he can't die. She rested her forehead on Henry's. The sound of her sobbing was muffled by the fog that had started creeping around them. An orange glow on the western horizon was all that remained of the sun. Night had come. 
Peace, said one of the revenants, holding up his hands. Don't move, Rowan shifted her stance to face him. You won't find St. Markovia's talisman there, the revenant said. His thick white hair touched the chainmail coif he wore on his shoulders. Vladimir took it with him when your friend slew his body. Your Vladimir just killed my friend, Rowan snarled. She poised her hand as though she were about to cast a spell. Just then, Irina screamed. Did we get it? Talking was painful. Henry! Irina said. You reckless bastard! I thought you were dead! Henry felt his neck. It was sticky with blood, but the wound had closed. I would slap you if I didn't think it would kill you. Irina clenched her fist for a moment, then hugged him. Don't you ever do that to me again! Henry lifted his right arm and held her, then turned to see Casimir on the ground beside him. Wow, Casimir, you look like shit, he said. Casimir gave a faint smile. Henry felt awful, but he knew he would be dead had it not been for the elf's magic. Thanks, he said, then looked to Irina. At least we have it now, right? Then Henry noticed the armored revenant standing near Rowan. He grabbed Apollo and tried to sit up. Please, don't be alarmed, said the revenant. My name is Sir Godfrey Gwillem, and I mean you no harm. While Vladimir is gone, I am the captain of the Knights of the Silver Dragon. Sir Godfrey ordered the other knights back inside the castle. Then he addressed Henry and his companions. Do the four of you truly mean to face Strahd von Zarevich? Will you try to kill us if we say yes? Henry asked. On the contrary, Godfrey said in a soft voice. I will help you in any way I can. Then tell us where the talisman is, Rowan said with pursed lips. It's with Vladimir. Godfrey's glowing white eyes looked down in shame. Vladimir has had the relic ever since St. Markovia died. It was hers. She crafted that talisman specifically to fight vampires. It has the power to paralyze them. But Vladimir had no intention of using it, and bound it to his spirit. He is the only one who can give it away, and he never will. But there might be another way to get it. Come with me, and I'll show you. He gestured for them to follow. Rowan and Irina helped Henry and Casimir to their feet, and together they walked with Sir Godfrey to the mausoleum in the graveyard. Sir Godfrey murmured a password and a stone panel on the side of the mausoleum grinded open. They all went inside. A torch was lit, and the flame illuminated four empty alcoves. On the far wall, they saw a verse written in draconic. Sir Godfrey put his hand on the inscription. It says, Here lies the mighty Argenvost, Lord of the Order of the Silver Dragon. After we were defeated and killed by Strahd's army at the final siege of Argenvostolt, Vladimir's spirit did not rest. By some black magic, he returned to the mortal world in the corpse of another man. He took an oath to seek out and destroy the one who had killed our beloved lord. Strahd had quartered the dragon's body and sent the pieces to the four corners of Barovia as a warning to his enemies. Then Vladimir further swore in his oath that Argenvost would be laid to rest. He summoned the spirits of the Order's most loyal knights and brought us back, asking us to take the same oath. We did. I did. I thought there would be peace once we killed Strahd and found a resting place for Argenvost. But when we marched to Castle Ravenloft, we found that Strahd was already dead. He had become a vampire, trapped in a lifeless existence of misery. So Vladimir brought us back to Argenvostolt, content with Strahd's fate. He never sought out the dragon's bones after that, though we knew where they were hidden. 
Vladimir was once the most honorable man I knew. It's why I loved him. But he's been corrupted by watching Strahd suffer. He strives for nothing but the vampire's torment. Yet he ignores the torment I endure every day, seeing revenge eat away at his soul. Godfrey shook his head. Sometimes we can't help those we love, no matter how we try. But now that you are here, there might be a way to release us from our oaths. Over the past centuries I have collected the bones of Argenvast from the far-flung reaches of the valley. They are all here beneath our feet, save for one, the dragon's skull. If his skull is united with his body within this tomb, then our oath will be fulfilled, and Argenvost's spirit will light this castle's beacon one last time. Then we revenant knights will depart from the land of the living, never to return. Since nothing from this world can be taken to the next, the talisman would be left here. Henry sat down on the floor, exhausted. Let me get this straight. You're saying that once the skull is buried in here, Vladimir will die, and we can have the talisman. Yes, Sir Godfrey said. Where is the skull of Argenvas now? Irina asked. Sir Godfrey looked to the east. In the house of the man who slew him, in Castle Ravenloft. Henry and the others spent the night at Argenvastolt. The revenants had no need for sleep, so the dormitory was in a sorry state of disrepair. Before going to bed, Casimir cast a sending spell to Elvir. The were-raven should have arrived at Ravenloft to check on Navarra. Hopefully he could relay a message to her. Sir Godfrey did not know where exactly in Ravenloft the skull was kept, so they needed Navarra if she was able, to find it. They awoke the next morning to discover a present for Henry, sitting at the front steps of the castle gate. It was a coffin with Henry's name on it. It's from him, Casimir said, reading the note on top of the lid. I wouldn't open it, Rowan said, standing beside Irina. What if there's someone inside? Casimir asked. None of them wanted to say it, but Henry could guess they were all thinking the same thing. Navarra. Herkimoid shivered on Henry's shoulder, sharing worried emotions. Henry frowned and put his hand on the coffin. Then he threw off the lid. A swarm of bats flew out, their leathery wings hitting Henry in the face. He drew back and watched them take off into the morning sky. There was nothing else in the coffin. Strahd was taunting them. Today was the second day the sun shone. The others, including Herkimoid, set out to talk with Sir Godfrey. But Henry just stood there, staring at the coffin. Apollo, Henry thought. Sup, man, Apollo said. You're looking better than yesterday. Henry still had a few bruises, but he was used to that by now. Apollo, what can you tell me about Sergei? Well, he's dead, Apollo said. Which is what you're going to be if you keep acting like you did yesterday. I'm alive, aren't I? Henry did not like being chastised by his own sword. We've only got one shot at this man. Believe me, I want to take Strahd down as much as you do. But you got to keep it cool. If you want to take him down, then tell me, what things did Sergei do that really pissed off his brother? So, you want to play with Strahd's head like he plays with yours? Something like that, Henry thought. And I want to know how Sergei dressed, his style, his manner, anything you can tell me. Uh-huh, I see where this is going. You've already got the Sergei look, but you want to walk the walk. Right on. So first, Sergei used to call his brother Brody. Strahd hated that. There was also this thing he did when people were trying to have a serious conversation with him. 
Sergei would play with a loose buckle on his clothes or pick at his fingernails, something to give the impression that he wasn't listening, even when he was. It used to drive Strahd nuts. Apollo recounted story after story. Apparently, Sergei had not been the best judge of character. He liked to give people the benefit of the doubt, thinking it was better to be fooled than to be cold-hearted. He would believe anyone's sob story, and often gave away everything he was carrying to passing beggars. He looked up to Strahd, and always thought the best of him. Even when Strahd played cruel jokes on his little brother, Sergei would usually laugh along and make excuses for his behavior. Apollo went on telling Henry of how Strahd had openly scorned Sergei's lack of soldierly ambition, all the while envying his brother's talents in more peaceful and academic pursuits. You know, man, Apollo said, it's a good thing you found me. It's like Sergei got his final wish to help Tatiana. Henry pondered hard after listening to all these stories. Though he didn't remember a life before being Henry Gibson, all the pieces fit into place. His wings, his lack of resemblance to his parents, drawing the sword from the stone, the way fate had brought him to Irina, meeting Sergei in the pool. Henry had been worried for so long about others controlling his destiny. But could it be that he had asked for this? That somehow he had been given a second chance? Henry moved out from the shadow of the castle and looked to the rising sun. As the warm rays beat down on his face, Henry finally knew who he was. So, man, Apollo said, you going to act like Sergei to mess with Strahd? Apollo, I am Sergei. <laughs>